It was January 8th, 2012. Melinda Coleman was sleeping peacefully in her bed when she was startled awake by the sound of a commotion in her front yard. Without hesitation, she ran to the front door and looked outside. What she saw brought her to her knees. Lying just feet away from her, covered in snow, was her teenage daughter, Daisy. She was unconscious and wearing nothing but a t-shirt and yoga pants. Daisy had been lying here so long that her hair became frozen and stuck to the ground. Melinda ran to get the help of her three sons, and together they pulled the girl from the snow and dragged her inside to the warmth of their home. They first tried to warm her up by wrapping blankets around her, but when that didn't work, they placed her in a tub of warm water. That was when her mother noticed the bruises. Daisy was immediately rushed to the hospital for treatment, but when the police arrived, her mother couldn't have prepared herself for what she was about to hear. See, the police were largely unconcerned. In fact, in their eyes, this young girl, she got what she deserved. Considering this story takes place in the small, peaceful town of Maryville, Missouri, it was a story that shocked the entire state when news began to break regarding what had happened to young Daisy Coleman. Daisy had grown up in Missouri with her three brothers and her mother, Melinda Coleman, who was a local veterinarian. The children were forced to grow up without a stable father figure in their lives because, tragically, Michael, Daisy's father, lost his life in a car accident when Daisy was about 11 years old. To say that Michael's passing had a profound effect on the family would be a tragic understatement. The loss of Michael nearly tore the family completely apart. The family of five had only just begun to recover from Michael's passing when this situation with Daisy reared its ugly head. Prior to the crime, Daisy had been an outgoing, incredibly happy, and carefree young girl. She was incredibly popular in school and was even one of the star cheerleaders. To say that she had it all, well, that'd be putting it lightly. Daisy was a girl that every other girl her age aspired to be. She was surrounded by a flock of close friends, had access to all the cutest guys in her school, and to top it off, her brother was best friends with the school's most popular football player. With all this in mind, it made it all the more shocking when the events of that fateful evening unfolded, leading up to Daisy being found nearly frozen on her front lawn. When Daisy was rushed to the hospital at about 5 a.m. on January 8th, it quickly became clear what had taken place. Doctors and nurses ran to Daisy's side, and from the very beginning, they were certain of one thing. Daisy had been forced against her will and taken advantage of. The evidence was obvious. She had bruises that covered the insides of her legs, proving she'd endured some serious trauma. She was almost completely unconscious, and her alcohol level was 0.13%. The legal limit in Missouri is just 0.08%, so Daisy was nearly double that. But you have to keep in mind, by the time Daisy was taken to the hospital, it's believed it had been about five hours since the crime had actually taken place, meaning her alcohol level had been gradually dropping that entire time. So, if it was at 0.13% after all this time, you can only imagine how intoxicated she must have been when the crime unfolded. She would have been nearly comatose. When Daisy finally began to regain consciousness a few hours later, it was very clear that she was in no condition to recount the events of that evening. But thankfully, she wasn't the only person present that night when the crime unfolded. Daisy's close friend, Paige Parkhurst, stepped up and helped police better understand what had taken place that night. Paige appeared to have been profoundly affected by the events of that evening. When she spoke with investigators about the night in question, she seemed a bit distant and was clearly rattled. Still, she managed to tell detectives that she and Daisy had been invited to a small party at the home of Maryville's star football player, Matt Barnett. She recalls that Daisy had gotten the phone number of Matt and the two were texting back and forth throughout the evening. Now, some sources say that the two had been flirting between one another, but I haven't been able to 100% confirm this. Either way, during their conversation, Daisy learned that Matt was having a small get-together at his parents' house in the basement. The only thing was, his parents didn't know about it. It was just a small gathering between Matt and a few of his friends, nothing crazy, and Matt asked the two girls if they wanted to come. Obviously, with Matt being the most popular guy in school, the girls jumped at the opportunity. No sooner than the girls arrived at this party, though, they grew a bit nervous because they quickly realized they were the only two girls in attendance that night. 
This definitely put them on edge a little bit, but nothing about the party seemed too crazy. It was just a bunch of teenagers getting together to share some laughs amongst their friends. But then the alcohol came out. Shortly after they arrived, Paige says that the host of the party, Matt Barnett, started pushing drinks on Daisy. Paige seems to have suggested that prior to this night, neither she nor Daisy had ever had alcohol before. But not wanting to disappoint their peers, they both accepted drinks and vowed to have a good time. They were both ushered to the basement, where they were told to stay quiet so as not to wake up Matt's parents. And this was the moment when everything changed. Paige says that as the door to the basement shut behind them, she realized what was really going on here. Just minutes later, without any warning, one of the boys grabbed Paige by the hand and forced her into a nearby room. And when he shut the door, well, things didn't go the way Paige had planned. She was taken advantage of, and considering this boy was far, far larger than her, she was helpless to stop it. When the event was finally over and Paige was able to break free, she took off into the other room and quickly noticed Daisy was nowhere to be found. Matt Barnett was missing as well. Paige made her way to one of the only other rooms in the basement, and that's when she found both Matt and Daisy. Tragically, Daisy was in the midst of suffering the same fate as Paige. It didn't take long before Matt exited the room, seemingly clear-headed and perfectly coherent, almost looking as though he was proud of what he had done. When Daisy finally stumbled to the doorway, it was clear she was not in a good place. She wasn't able to stand up on her own without assistance, and she was more or less limp due to the amount of alcohol she'd consumed by this point. We don't know how much alcohol she consumed willingly and how much was forced on her by the boys at the party, but needless to say, she was wildly drunk and had no idea what was going on. Almost immediately after Daisy exited the room, barely even conscious, the girls were then led to a car and taken home. The boys drove the girls back to Daisy's house where the two had been having a sleepover before sneaking out for this party. As soon as they pulled up in front of the house, the boys told Paige to go on inside and get some sleep. They said that they would take care of Daisy and make sure that she made it in. Paige believed them and headed back inside, going to bed fully believing Daisy would be inside just a minute or two later. As soon as Paige's head hit the pillow, she was out like a light. She only awoke hours later when she heard the commotion caused by Daisy's mother and brothers bringing her inside from the cold. No one knows just how many hours had passed since Paige had gone inside that night, but Considering Daisy's hair was frozen solid and stuck to the ground beneath her, it's safe to assume she'd spent an incredibly long time out in the cold. It would eventually be discovered that after Paige made it inside that night, the boys just pulled Daisy from the car, then tossed her onto the front lawn in the middle of the snow, speeding away from the scene so as not to get caught in the act. They could not have cared less about her if they tried. And after Paige revealed all of this to the police, Daisy's brother Charlie opened up and said that he knew Paige was telling the truth because he'd found Daisy's phone buried in the snow near where she'd been dumped. When he looked through her text messages, he found that she'd been having flirtatious conversations with Matt Barnett, a guy who, up until this point, he'd considered to be one of his closest friends. Considering he knew Matt better than anyone, he knew what he was capable of. But the police, well, they weren't buying it. After Paige told her story to investigators, they called Matt Barnett down to the station for questioning. Needless to say, Matt's version of events was completely different from what Paige had said. According to Matt, he didn't simply invite Daisy and Paige over that evening. According to him, Daisy had begged him for an invite to their get-together, and he seems to have only agreed because he found her attractive. He also claims that Daisy had been slightly drunk when she arrived at the party. And this statement may have actually been true because Paige admitted later on that she and Daisy had snuck a few sips of alcohol from Daisy's mother's liquor cabinet just moments before sneaking out to go to the party, trying to loosen themselves up and not embarrass themselves in front of Matt. According to Matt, when the girls arrived at the party, Daisy agreed to follow them to the bedroom before she'd ever even been handed a drink. He insists that their actions were consensual and Daisy only began drinking after their relations were over. He made it painfully clear that Daisy knew exactly what she was getting herself into, and that she had been a willing participant. But the more he shared his version of events, the more things changed. See, at first, he claimed he didn't know the name of the girl that had tagged along with Daisy that night. But just a few moments later, he referred to her by name, Paige. 
He also claimed to have never given Daisy a drink until after they had relations. But again, moments later, he admitted to giving her a few drinks to, quote, break the ice. What's insane about this whole ordeal is that the officer who was conducting the interview with Matt was totally unconcerned, and he made that incredibly clear. In fact, at one point during the interview, the officer can be seen lounging in his chair, hands behind his head, as if shooting the breeze with a close friend. When Matthew admitted to dropping Daisy off on her front lawn that evening, literally tossing her into a pile of snow, the officer didn't even question it. He actually applauded Matt for making sure she made it home, quote, safely. If this weren't bad enough, one of the other boys who'd been present that evening, Jordan Zeck, admitted that he'd filmed the relations between Daisy and Matt that evening, capturing the footage through a small crack in the doorway. But interestingly, as soon as the police asked to take a look at this footage, it had miraculously been deleted. Why he deleted the footage, well, that's never been explained. But I think it's clear to see that Jordan was most likely covering for his friend. Thankfully, despite the fact that the police had largely been blowing the whole thing off and doing their best to sweep it under the rug, they finally agreed to act on the situation. Before the sun had set that evening, police arrested Matt Barnett, Jordan Zeck, and another boy who's never been named. But unfortunately, things wouldn't be that easy. By this point, Daisy had begun to wake up. And the story she told investigators? Well, it wasn't pretty. When we hear about awful stories like this, it can be easy to forget that we can all end up in bad situations sometimes. Whether it's a night out with friends that suddenly goes horribly wrong, or if it's a simple mistake we've made that alters the course of our day or even our lives. The best way to keep ourselves out of dangerous situations is to keep our wits about us. But for some of us, we may need a little extra help doing that. This is where I place my trust in Magic Mind, an awesome mental performance shot that helps me feel a lot more focused and certainly provides a much needed boost of energy. Magic Mind has nearly everything you could want to help improve your mental clarity, including nootropics for focus, matcha for a boost of energy, adaptogens to keep your stress levels low, and heaps of vitamins. My favorite thing about Magic Mind is that the caffeine doesn't leave you all jittery. Since it comes from ceremonial grade matcha, it's a very smooth and even wave of energy that lasts most of the day and still lets you fall peacefully asleep at night. Magic Mind is backed by real world doctors and it was developed over the course of 10 years. Over 200 studies have been conducted regarding the ingredients in Magic Mind and all of the mushrooms, and yes, mushrooms that are used in it are grown organically in California. Now, I'll admit, I'm not much of a supplement guy, but the effects of Magic Mind, in my opinion, are undeniable. Now, it's not a one-shot fix-all. It takes a few days for the ingredients to build up in your body before you'll get the full effect, and it's designed to become a part of your morning routine to enhance your mood, motivation, and your focus. And it's certainly the best mental performance shot that I've ever used. The taste isn't too bad either. One of the main flavors that comes through is passion fruit, which I, I personally love. Give Magic Mind a try by visiting magicmind.com slash tiknots and using code TIENOTS20 to get up to 56% off your first order in the next 10 days. The best part about this offer is that there's a 100% money back guarantee if you decide you don't like it. All of your money back, no questions asked. Pretty much a risk-free investment. So give it a shot and let me know what you think. But let's get back to the story. As Daisy finally began to come to her senses, she could only remember bits and pieces of what had unfolded that evening. She didn't remember many details at all, but she did remember drinking before sneaking out of her home that night, then being given copious amounts of alcohol after arriving at the party. Unfortunately, she didn't realize that she'd overindulged until it was far too late. She couldn't recall having any sort of relationship with Matt that evening, and the only clear image of that evening that she could remember was a dog jumping on her lap while she was sitting on a couch. Seconds later, she passed out. Now, for anyone with half a brain, you know that Daisy's version of events clearly proves that from the moment she arrived at that party, she was not in control of her body. This alone should prove that Matt almost certainly took advantage of her that night. There was no way that he didn't, especially if she was already drunk the moment she arrived, as she would later admit. Even though Matt denied all of the charges that were placed against him, his friend, the one who's never been named, confessed to what he had done to Paige that evening. He pleaded guilty in court and recalled every detail of that night, including every time that Paige begged him to stop and she repeatedly told him no. In the end, he was sentenced to spend time in a juvenile facility, but Matt, Matt wasn't going down without a fight. 
He denied everything from the very beginning and even made sure to tell all of his friends and peers that Daisy was nothing more than a liar. With the intention of putting this whole situation behind her and letting the law decide how things should play out, Daisy then made the incredibly brave call to return to school while the investigation was carried out. She'd hoped that her friends and peers would support her and back her up on her allegations against Matt, but nothing could have been further from the truth. When Daisy arrived back at school, it seemed as though the entire student body had turned against her. In stark contrast to her expectations, everybody was being supportive of Matt, not Daisy. She was subjected to every type of bullying you could imagine because everyone believed that she'd made the whole thing up. The thing is, in the small community of Maryville, Matt's family name was known far and wide. His whole family was known for being the best of the best in everything they did. So it seemed unfathomable that Matt would be capable of something like this. Considering the influence his family had over the town, well, it's easy to see why everyone sided with Matt. As a result, Daisy lost most of her childhood friends who'd now turned their back on her. She was labeled every offensive name you could think of, and no one wanted anything to do with her anymore. Daisy's brother, Charlie, who was supremely popular at the school and had formerly been best friends with Matt, was pretty much the only person who tried to protect her from the hate and the bullying. He took every opportunity to explain that he had proof that Daisy's allegations were true, but no one wanted to hear it. Within a matter of days, Daisy was merely a fragment of her former self. She lost all of her friends, she lost every bit of her popularity, and worse yet, she had to live in a world where no one believed a word she said. If this weren't bad enough, the Maryville Town Sheriff, Darren White, had spoken up and made it painfully clear he didn't believe Daisy either. He repeatedly claimed that his sympathy was with Matt, who was being held against his will for crimes he didn't commit. Sheriff White wanted more than anything to have these charges dropped and move on with his career, but in his eyes these two lying girls simply wouldn't let that happen. When Sheriff White was later confronted with the idea that he may be wrong and the girls may be telling the truth, he literally laughed. He believed that the girls were simply doing it for attention, even though Paige's assailant had already confessed, been charged, and sent to juvenile detention. If this wasn't bad enough, he even took to insulting Daisy's mother, Melinda, claiming that Melinda loved being able to play the victim and get sympathy from her peers. Remember, this is a widowed single mother who was simply doing the best she could to keep her family together less than three years after the tragic loss of her husband and the horrific assault of her daughter. At what point in time are you allowed to be a victim if not in this exact situation? But if you could imagine, the worst was yet to come. After several months of being told that a court date would be set very soon, the Coleman family finally received news from the local authorities. They were excited to hear what kind of development had taken place in the case. But that's when they were told every charge against both Matt and Jordan, the boy who filmed the ordeal, had been dropped. Nothing else would be done, and both boys were free to return to their daily lives. The reason the police were able to do this was because of a slip of the tongue on Daisy's part. When Daisy was first coming out of her drunken days in the hospital, the officers posed a loaded question. Is there any chance that you may have told the boys that you would exchange sexual favors for alcohol? Daisy replied, quote, I guess, and that was the end of it. The legal team used this statement against her and had the entire case dismissed. Paige, who was coherent the entire evening, claimed she'd never witnessed such a phrase leave Daisy's mouth, but it was pointless. The damage was done and the case was closed. The thing you have to keep in mind is that Daisy didn't even remember anything from that night, so her response of, I guess, was nothing more than an honest assessment of the situation, not a suggestion or admission of guilt. Think of it like this. I hand you a sealed cardboard box, and I ask you, is there a chance there's a cat inside this box? Well, the only honest answer would be, sure, I guess. You have no idea what's inside the box, any more than Daisy had any idea what was going on in that basement. At this point, many people began to wonder if Matt's grandfather may have played a part in having these charges dropped. See, his grandfather was a former cop and a state representative. So to say that he had some pull with the Maryville Police Department would be an understatement. I honestly can't find the words to describe just how much of an influence the Barnetts had over this small town. It's, it's truly sickening. At this point, for Daisy, her life was essentially ruined. 
She faced relentless bullying, both online and in person, and there was nothing she could do to stop it. This led her to attempt to take her own life four times. She became so fragile and such a danger to herself that her family removed the door from her bedroom so that they could always keep an eye on her. I can't believe I'm saying this, but somehow things still managed to get worse from here. Because while the family were away one evening, someone actually set their home on fire. Thankfully, no one was harmed, but the Coleman family vowed this was the end of the road. They packed up what was left of their belongings and left the city, moving several miles away to a neighboring town with a different police force and a whole new set of faces, finally giving themselves a fresh start. It was around this same time that Daisy's case started to gain attention on a national scale, and it didn't take long before an underground group of hackers learned of the criminal mischief that Sheriff White was up to, and they promised to put an end to it. A team of hackers known as Anonymous stepped up, and they didn't just ask for the case to be reopened, they demanded it. Their historic tagline sent chills down the spine of the Maryville Police Department and everyone involved in the investigation. We are anonymous. We are legion. We do not forgive. We do not forget. For those of you who may not be aware, anonymous is a group of people that you don't want to mess with. No one even knows how many members of Anonymous there are, but each and every one of them is the best of the best when it comes to hacking. These people will find out information about you that you yourself probably didn't even know. They took on a similar case from Ohio and managed to hack into the personal social media accounts of various high school students who were connected to an eerily similar crime that took place there, exposing not only their personal information, but also private chats, photos, and videos each of which confirmed the involvement of many students who police didn't even consider to be suspects at that time. When Anonymous took on Daisy's case, the Maryville police knew they had messed up. When they demanded justice for Daisy, Missouri state authorities finally knew they had to step in and do something. Soon afterward, they announced that a new prosecutor would be taking a look at the investigation and re-examining the evidence. But unfortunately, there simply wasn't enough here to lead to a conviction or even lead to new charges. The police had Daisy cornered. That one statement she made while still stuck in a drunken stupor had tainted the entire case. There was simply nothing that could be done. Thankfully, Matt was finally held accountable for something, though. While he couldn't be charged for taking advantage of Daisy, he was charged and convicted for dumping her in the snow that evening. But still, he didn't spend a single night in jail. He was given two years probation and a four month suspended sentence. He also had to pay $1,800 in restitution to the Coleman family, as if that actually did anything. After all was said and done, Daisy somehow managed to continue pushing herself through high school and eventually even got a scholarship to Missouri Valley College. She later decided to get as far away from her haunting past as she possibly could opting to move to Colorado to begin life anew as a tattoo artist. By this point, she was suffering severely with PTSD. She wanted so desperately to get away from the ghosts of her past. But no matter how fast she ran, tragedy was lurking just around the corner. In June of 2018, as Daisy was packing up her things and moving homes, her mother and brother offered to help her with the move. Her brother Tristan was riding with Melinda, their mother, when they were involved in a single car accident. Melinda was severely injured but made it out. Tristan did not. He lost his life immediately upon impact, leaving yet another dark hole in this family's history. But by this point in the story, you have to realize there's several minutes of this video left, and the story of the Coleman family is far from over. In the years following the horrific ordeal that Daisy had endured, she decided the only way to move past this was to share her story with others as a warning. She didn't want what happened to her to ever happen to any other child on this planet. She started speaking much more openly about her traumatic past and appeared in various interviews and speaking events to share her message. But by the summer of 2020, Daisy's past had finally caught up with her. At around four in the afternoon on August 4th, 2020, Melinda called in the Denver police and asked them to perform a welfare check on Daisy because she'd been incredibly depressed and hadn't heard from her in a while. When officers showed up, everything seemed fine. As a precaution, a crisis prevention agent stayed behind for a good while to better assess the situation and ensure that Daisy was safe. He left later on that evening. 
No sooner than he drove away, Daisy claimed her own life. She was pronounced deceased at the age of just 23 at 8.30 that evening. When Sheriff White found out about Daisy claiming her life, it seems he had a change of heart and finally admitted he may have been wrong all those years ago. At least that's the story I wish I could share. As it would turn out, Sheriff White doubled down on his stance against Daisy. In fact, it was election season and he was running to be re-elected as the town's sheriff. In one of his speeches, if you could even imagine, this man took to the stage and proclaimed that Daisy decided to take her life at this particular moment as a way to spite him, bringing her story back into the spotlight and ruining his chances of winning the re-election. This man literally said this. Praise God this man lost the election by a landslide. But still, the story isn't over. Four months after Daisy claimed her own life, her mother took to social media, posting several remembrances of her daughter. It's safe to say at this moment she wasn't just thinking about Daisy, though. I feel certain that memories of Tristan, as well as her late husband, must have been flooding her mind. Because right after posting to social media, she too took her own life. Thanks again to Magic Mind for sponsoring today's video. Visit magicmind.com slash tieknots and use code tieknots20 for up to 56% off your first order, completely risk-free. Thank you guys for tuning in to another episode of True Crime Stories. If you enjoyed this video, check out this other interesting case I covered, and don't forget to subscribe. It's totally free and keeps you up to date with all of my future videos. You can also click that join button below to show your support for the channel and see new videos long before everyone else does. But my name is Ty Knotts, and I'll catch you guys in the next one.